Okay. Thank you. How you doing? Okay, I have 50 minutes. Is it 50 minutes I have for my talk, I think? 49. Wow, we're moving fast already. I like to joke around, 50 minutes is not a long time. After 30, 30, what, 35 years of doing this work, 30 years of traveling around the country and outside the country, and a lot of talks, a lot of talks. Been doing this for a long time. You got a lot of ideas, a lot of things roll through your head. And I th say in 50 minutes, I can't even get the opening jokes done in, in 15 minutes. So I'm just going to hit three quick ones just to kind of break the ice, get things warmed up here a little bit. Standard operating jokes. I love these. These are fun. They're not that great, but they, they work. Number one, my name is Doug, spelled D-O-U-G, while I'm alive. But when I die, they're going to spell it D-U-G because then I'll be in the past tense. Okay, yeah, that's not a great joke, but it works. It sets up the next two, and the last one is better than the first, but it's not that great, but because the first one's so bad, it makes the last one look really good. Here's the second one. Name is Doug Barry, but when I die, they're gonna switch my names. Someone's always gotta say it, yeah, you gotta say it. Barry Doug, I get it, okay. When I die, my wife, they're gonna call her Douglas. All right, thank you. Ah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. 48 minutes, 24 seconds shown right here in the clock. So let's get rolling here. Gentlemen, uh, I've been very, very blessed to be um, all over the country and do a lot of just really evangelization work is incredible. It's a privilege to do right now. It is an honor to be at this conference with you all. It's a real honor to be uh, lined up with Father Donald Calloway and Scott Hom. Both of these men have been great inspirations to me. You know, when it was mentioned that the three men that inspired me most uh, were King David, and I'll explain that in a bit, uh, John the Baptist and St. Joseph. There are reasons for that, but in all honesty, I've also been very inspired by both Father Calloway and Scott Hahn. Uh, Scott, when years ago, before I ever met Scott, and I bumped into a bit of a conferences around the country and down to EB10 a few times and so forth and such, and, you know, Scott would, would speak so passionately about, about the church, about the covenants, you know, about sacraments and and I was always affected, even though some of what he was saying was over my head, because he's a scripture scholar and I barely got out of high school. Uh, I was so engaged by the way he said it, by the passion. You know? Father Calloway, same way. What a great conversion story Father Calloway's had. Kicked out of a country. Do you know about that? Japan. They didn't want him back in anymore. It's another story. You can talk to him about it. All right? But the inspiration of both these gentlemen and the fire and the passion with which they speak, it's an honor to be involved in this conference with both of them. I mean that sincerely. Uh, a little background about myself. Born and raised in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Married 30 years in a month. 30 years. Beautiful woman. Very, very blessed. My wife and I have been very blessed to co-create uh, with God seven children, two miscarriages, five living. My youngest is 19. He's a boy. I've got three other boys who are 21, 23, and 26, and then I've got a daughter who's 27. My two oldest uh, have both have spouses now, and now I have grandchildren, and it's just a real honor, real blessing to be a father and a grandfather and a husband, most important things I ever do on this planet. Because when I die, when we all die, no one's going to think about the stuff that we do, really. It's just going to be our loved ones, really. I mean, I've, I've spoken all over the place. I've had uh, two TV shows on EWTN, one Life on the Rock for eight years. I co-hosted with Father Mark Mary, Life on the Rock. And now I do a show called Battle Ready on EWTN. And I've been doing that show now for a few years, uh, 24 episodes or so that we've done now. I forget where we are now with it. Uh, and that's, that's just, it's fantastic. But with, when I die, you know what they're going to do on EWTN? You know, they're going to give you a little, like a, like a probably two-minute montage, just clips of the shows. And then, okay, and next we have, and they'll move right on. All right? The only people that are really going to care is the woman on the end of this ring and my children. And we, you know, think about this, man, because we go through life, and a lot of times we focus on so many other things other than the most important people, the most important things. You know, emphasize a little bit here what Father mentioned in the homily about relocating the chair, right? The chair in front of the TV to the chair at the dinner table. Chair at the office and so forth. What I would tell my kids all the time, I try to do this all the time, and I hope and pray I did, and I've asked my kids if I did, because I talk about it, and they say, yeah, Dad, you did, is my little home office, I'm sitting there working on my desk doing something, and my kids would come in and ask me a question. I tried my very best to make sure that I turned my entire chair and faced them to answer them, and didn't just give one of these. What was that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. No, no, no. no go, go ask your mom. Instead, stop what you're doing. Turn. Face your kid. Square up to shoulders with them. Let them know, I'm here. 
And I tried to do that. And unless it's a question like, hey, Dad, you going to have that last piece of chicken? What? No, no, go ahead. You can have it. That's fine. That's different. I normally don't turn, let's talk about chicken. <laughs> There's a time and a place, obviously. But if it's a serious question at all, your kids need you, your wife needs you, turn, face them. Body language says everything. It says everything. All right? It's very, very important we understand that part. So, background by myself. Born and raised Catholic. I don't have a great conversion story. Scott's got a great conversion story. So does Father Calloway. You know, they can pack a church, right? I mean, Scott was out there trying to save the world. All the Catholics, right? Because we were just, you know, living with the whore of Babylon, the Antichrist, and so forth. And very noble, right? And as a scripture scholar, he embraces the Catholic faith. And now he's, he's a great leader and speaker in the church. Father Calloway, of course, had a really rough background. Rebel, surfing rebel, hippie type of kid. And boom, major conversion. They can pack a church. I'm like most of you, born and raised Catholic. Uh, that's why, you know, I don't really fill the churches like they do. But I am like most of you. Born and raised Catholic, I'm guessing, most of you. Going through motions most of the time until something really maybe kicks you in the gut, kicks you in the shin and wakes you up a little bit. I was the poster child of a clock-in, clock-out Catholic. You walk into church, put your hand in the holy water font, clock in, walk out after mass, clock out. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? And that was the extent of my faith. And if you would have asked me, you want to go to hell? I said, no. You want to go to heaven? Yeah. What are you doing about it? I clock in every Sunday <laughs> as if that was going to cut it. And then years later... I'm about 20, 21 years old. I'm dating this wonderful woman who's now my wife, and I hear about the Blessed Mother appearing in the world. Now, it hadn't been approved, so I, I don't talk about that particular episode because what was being uh, talked about was not approved by the church and so forth. So I thought, well, okay, this is interesting. And my aunt, God rest her soul, who was the one who told me about it, I went to her and said, tell me about this. What do you mean she's appearing? The Mother of God? Oh, yeah, Doug, apparitions. Apparitions? Yeah, she's appearing. What's she saying? She's giving us serious messages, even warning us of chastisement. And that word chastisement stood out to me. I said, what, what, what do you mean by that? Has this ever happened before? Oh, yeah. When? And she said, check out Fatima, 1917. So I went back and pulled that book out. You know the little prayer books you get? And you put them in the drawer? <laughs> you all have that, don't you? You know, especially you're growing up. Some, oh, and Grandma gives you something. And this is for you. Oh, thank you, Grandma. This is going... In the drawer. It's going to keep it safe in the drawer. The drawer doesn't get open very often except to put things in it. All right? Get a scapular, by the way. Some of you enrolled in the brown scapular. You know, we get the scapular a lot of times. A little side note here. When we uh, receive our first communion, get enrolled in the scapular, brown scapular. You know what it says on the scapular. You know what our blessed mother said. I loved everything Father Calloway was talking about. Blessed mother constantly coming to the world, constantly bringing us the truth and all these miracles. Heaven has shown us with, with incredible, incredible things happening still this day. Well, one of them was 1251. She appeared to St. Simon Stock in England. She appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Now, Mount, Mount, Carmel, Mount Carmel is not in England. It's in the Holy Land. That's where the great battle in the Old Testament took place between Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. That really serious battle where those false prophets are dancing around, they're cutting themselves, they're bleeding out, they're getting nutty. And Elijah's making fun of them a little bit. Maybe your God can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's busy. Might want to yell a little bit louder. So Elijah's got a little bit of attitude. I like that attitude. Right? Finally, he says, enough of this. And he puts together the altar of the 12 stones, right? And he has the, the holocaust of the animal cut laid on the altar there, has a trench dug out around it pours buckets of water over it so it's all drenched, it's wet, then he calls on God, one little statement in Scripture, and fire came down from heaven. And then we move on. Let's stop at that statement for a moment. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice and the stones and the water, left that little ditch dry. And everybody looked at that moment and then looked at these 450 goofballs over here who'd cut themselves, and they're all standing there going, what? And they look at Elijah, and he's going, check this out. And they drop to their knees, and Elijah says, round up the 450 prophets. We're taking them down to the wadi, this dried-up lake bed, pond bed at the bottom, and he put them to death. This is not a game. This is a serious battle, battle we are in. And so Our Lady of Mount Carmel appears to St. Simon Stock in 1251 and says, look, I'm going to give you something. It is amazing. It's the brown scapular. And it's written on the scapular. Many of you might see this, have seen this, or have this. And if they got them out here, if you don't have one, you best go buy one, find a priest, get yourself enrolled in the brown scapular. Because this is what she said. Those who die wearing this, faithful, faithful to what it represents. A life consecrated to Jesus through our blessed mother. 
faithful to that. You die wearing this, you will not suffer the fires of hell. Whoa! I don't know why we're not duct taping this to our kids when they're sleeping at night. <laughs> or better yet, a little drop of Gorilla Glue right there. Jimmy wakes up. Dad, why can't I get this? Don't even try. <laughs> We'd have to have it surgically removed, and we're not doing that, and I'll leave it on there. I love you. I don't want you to go to hell. What do we do with this? We put it in the drawer. Or one kid said to me, eh, I got one of those at home. I said, yeah, where is it? Oh, it's hanging on my bedpost. I said, why you got it on your bedpost? You want your bed to go to heaven when it dies? I mean, what's the point of that? Weapons. We've been given weapons. This, and of course, we've been praying it throughout the day. The rosary, right? Mine is in its sheath right now, right? Present the weapon, right? We've been saying this all day. The power of the rosary, the power of the scapular. It's like a sword in one hand, a shield wrapped around you here. Spiritual battle, it's real. So when I heard about the Blessed Mother appearing in Fatima, Portugal, 1917, and I read the account, I pulled that little prayer book out of my drawer, and I started reading through it, and I was terrified. Because on July 13th, she told them about a, uh, she showed them a vision of hell, and she told them about things that were coming if man didn't stop offending God. That was what it was. World War I was about to end, she said. This war will end soon. It ended the next year. It was the worst war the world had ever seen. She said, but if man does not stop offending God, there will be a second war. It will be far worse than this one. World War II began about 21 years later. The death toll by the end of World War I was in the area of about 22 to 25 million people. The death toll by the end of World War II was near 70 million. Mary prophesied it. And she said it would occur for one main reason. If man does not stop offending God. This line over here of confessions is something we should be seeing in churches everywhere, every week. We men need to be fighting like never before to stay in, get back in if we're not there yet, and stay in the state of grace. Sanctifying grace. Simple 101 catechesis here. When we're baptized, we receive sanctifying grace. Some call it sharing God's life. Saints have said it's even greater than that. One saint said, if God had not shown me who he was, I would have thought sanctifying grace was God. It's this amazing relationship with God through sanctifying grace. Without sanctifying grace, when we die, we will not go to heaven. We won't. We lose sanctifying grace by committing mortal sin. We gain sanctifying grace back, sanctifying grace back by the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, penance. There are three conditions for something to be a mortal sin. I like to do this a lot when I do confirmation retreats for young people or college students and doing talks with them. I'll offer money. I'll give you 20 bucks if you can stand up and recite the three conditions that have to be in place for something to be a mortal sin. You'd be shocked how many try and have no clue what they're talking about, but there's money. They see the money, they get all excited. They start salivating. Ooh, 20 bucks. Yeah, what are the three conditions? Uh, let me see. You have to, uh, it's got um, murder. No, no, that's, that's, you're naming a sin. I'm talking about the three conditions. But I know you all know that, gentlemen, otherwise you, wait, well, maybe you don't. It must be a grave matter. It must be a grave, serious matter. You must have full knowledge of it, and you must have full consent. You do of your own free will. So full knowledge, full consent of a grave matter constitutes a mortal sin. If we're in a state of mortal sin, like pornography, is grave matter. Contraception is grave matter. All right? Those are a couple of big ones that a lot of men don't hear much about from the pulpit. And yet, I don't even want to blame the priest all the time. And we need to hear from the pulpit, don't get me wrong, but I'm a husband and father. Why aren't I sharing it with my brothers? Contraception will destroy, continues to destroy. It is undermining left and right. I told a guy one time, I was working a construction job with a guy, and I said, hey, you know contraception, your wife's on contraception, you know, you're wearing a condom, whatever it may be, first thing, first, that's the first step in treating your wife like an object. And he stopped what he was doing. And he looked at me, and like 30 seconds, his face just went, oh, whoa, metanoia moment here, right? And he looked at me, and he said, you're right, man. That is what I'm doing. Pornography, epidemic problem like never before, right? And one of the reasons is because we're giving little instruments like this to our kids when they're seven, eight, nine years old with no filters, no formation, no training, no discipline going on. The pressure of society, mom, dad, got to have my phone. And we, buck, we buckle oftentimes with this, right? And we give into this sort of thing. This little computer that we walk around with, if we're not careful, if we're not well-trained, well-formed, strong, praying, and accountable to others, the whole nine yards, natural and supernatural, got to fight the battle on both sides there. If we're not doing that, we can fall into it. We know it. We're men. 
I've heard priests more now today at different conferences tell me, and I heard one priest, I was at a men's conference last fall, and uh, he stands up and he says, I've heard more confessions from 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys who are struggling with pornography than ever in my life. He said, it's bad. What are we doing about it? So there are grave matter issues out there that we need to, number one, we have full knowledge about, full consent. We're committing mortal sin. If we're in that state, that's what this line over here is for. Praise God for this, though. Praise God for confession. For all those priests back there. You can almost see smoke coming out of the hallway back there. You can almost hear the demons. <laughs> no. They don't want this. You realize, and we've interviewed exorcists on Life on the Rock, and I do a podcast. Anybody familiar with the podcast U.S. Grace Force with Father Richard Heilman? Some of you are. It's great. It's picking up speed. Look, go to, the, go to YouTube. I, I'm, I'm a big promoter of my stuff, okay? So I'm going to promote my stuff here. <laughs> I'm also going to promote Father Call, Callaway and, and Scott's stuff, though, because it's important that we understand. you got all going to know something here. Number one, this is how some of us make a living, in addition to stipends and donations and fundraising and so forth, selling materials. And I have a table, like, whoosh, right out here. It's Father Calloway's on this side of me, and Scott's over on this side of me. And the materials on those tables, I mean, that helps fund ministry. It helps fund families. It helps fund people behind the scenes. So when you buy DVDs, CDs, which I have several of, and there are Scott's materials or Father's books and so forth, you help fund the work that we do. There's no question about it. The second thing is when you buy that stuff out there and the other vendors as well, this is armament. This is artillery. Guys, this is serious stuff. And you know darn well there are people out there who you couldn't drag to a conference like this. And you know there are family members out there who are slipping away from the faith or have left the faith. We know this battle is real, and we see the consequence, the carnage rising, the smoke rising from the battlefield when you see marriages and families that are destroyed because of things like pornography. So right now, Father Calloway's got a book out there. He, we're in the, in the throes of this 33-day preparation and consecration of St. Joseph. If you don't have this copy of this book, he's got boxes of them out there. You need to clear that table out before he leaves today, right? And then this can be done not just in this time period. This, this, there's a book within a book, he calls it in here. It's great. It's more information about the power of St. Joseph, his intercessory ability in our lives. You know, it was revealed to Teresa of Avila by... Um, or Venerable, excuse me, uh, Venerable, uh, I think, Mary of Agreda, by, Saint, by the Blessed Mother herself, that when people die and stand before God, if we have not known St. Joseph, we will weep when we realize the intercessory power that he had and we didn't take advantage of. We had Bishop Hine on our U.S. Grace Force podcast. Go to YouTube, type in U.S. Grace Force. Easy to remember, think U.S. Space Force. Because when, when President Trump came up with the U.S. Space Force, that's when... That's when Father Heilman said, hey, you know what? We need a U.S. Grace Force. And then he called me and said, hey, you want to do a podcast? I said, you bet. So we put out a podcast every Wednesday. We had Father Calloway as one of our guests. We've had Father Chad Ripperger on, an exorcist, well-known exorcist on. That has, of all the views, that is skyrocketed above everything else, way above everything else. And you know why? Because people are starving to understand the spiritual battle. And how do we fight it? This is one of the key ways right here consecrate our lives to God through someone as powerful as St. Joseph and our Blessed Mother, without, without a doubt. But back to the point here. We're in the thick of this fight, and the fight is real. It's as real as it's ever been. It's getting more intense and more serious. And it's important that we, as men, take seriously what our role is in this. So when Bishop Hine was on one of our U.S. Grace Force podcasts a while back, he's the Bishop of Madison, Wisconsin, we talked about the power of St. Joseph, and this is what he said in there. He said, you realize that God the Father has two great masterpieces, the two greatest masterpieces he ever created. One, Blessed Mother, and even above the Blessed Mother, is the incarnation, the word become flesh. And both of those masterpieces were entrusted to one man, Joseph. So if God the Father is going to choose Joseph to protect and care for the two greatest masterpieces God the Father would ever create, where his own word become flesh in the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, and the Blessed Mother, we would be foolish, gentlemen, to not go to St. Joseph, learn from him, take him as a spiritual father, and just run hard and fast with that great warrior. He's a great saint. What happens in the... Uh, 
middle of the night when the angel comes to him and says, Herod has designs to destroy the child. You need to flee. And this is a great passage. I heard a priest give a great homily on this. He said, notice the two words in that passage. So by night, Joseph got up and he took Mary and Jesus and headed towards Egypt. By night. He said, you didn't travel back in that time period at night. In fact, when you traveled even during the day, most of the time they traveled in caravans because it was safer but you wouldn't go out at night unless it was absolutely urgent and you had absolute trust in God. And that's what Joseph did. He's an action hero, defending truth. That's why he's one of the three most inspirational men to me, St. Joseph, because of his his willingness to listen to God. So well-trained, as Bishop Hines said in in that episode of U.S. Grace Force podcast, that like a horse, tug on the rein left, or right, and the head turns immediately, knowing exactly this is where the writer wants me to go. That's powerful. We need to be men like that. So in tune with prayer. So in tune with mental prayer. So in tune with the rosary. It's a daily expression of who we are. You know, the rosary has become an extension of my life. I, I don't go anywhere with that one on me. Heard an exorcist say this, no Catholic should leave their house without a blessed rosary on their person. Women should have it in their purses or in their pocket. Men should have it in your pockets. I have two, two in my Jeep at home, one on my desk, one by my bed, one in my pocket, one in my backpack. Every rental car I get on trips comes out of the backpack, goes in the cup holder of the rental car. I want to see it. I want to use it. I want to have it close at hand at all times, all times. I never wanted to lay in my casket one day, and you know, God willing, we have a you know how the Catholic funerals go, and God willing, we have a, a, vis- a, a viewing of the body, you know, because you're okay to be viewed, if you know what I'm saying, depending on your death. But if I'm lying there in my casket and my kids come up, think about your death. Every day think about it, because it's coming. It could come today. We don't know. So if I'm lying there and the kids come up, I never wanted my kids to come up. You know, we're laying there, the hands are crossed over, and then they, oh, it's Catholic funeral? Oh, yeah, we'll put the rosary around the hand then. You don't know how that looks like, right? You want your kids to come up? I didn't want my kids to come up and see this. Oh, there's dad. Oh, look, he's he's gone. What's that? What's that on his hand? Dad never, dad never did that. That was not part of dad's life. I didn't want that. I want my kids to walk up, see the rosary on dad's hand, and say, that was what dad was all about. The school of the holy family. The mental prayer of delving into the life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, being in the streets of Jerusalem, being at Calvary, being there at the tomb and the resurrection that that decade, being there when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. What a great saint, John the Baptist. Love him. Why? Nothing, nothing got in his way. You know, we hear a lot about how to evangelize. I'm a big fan of evangelize always and if necessary use words, except... I'm not a big fan of that if we're using it as a cop-out, and a lot of people, I think, do. John the Baptist was one who would say, evangelize always, and you better open your mouth. Jesus is the one that says what? What you hear whispered in the heart and in silence, shout from where? Rooftops. Get your ladder out, men. Go home, get your ladder out, get on that rooftop and start letting it be known in the ways, places that God has called you to do it. But he's calling it to be done. So John the Baptist, all the words of John the Baptist in Scripture are what? Behold the Lamb of God. There is one coming greater than I. I cannot even unfasten his sandals. And what does he say to the Pharisees when they come out? You brood of vipers who warned you of the wrath to come. And what does he say from there? Don't claim that you're children of Abraham. God can raise up the stones and turn them into children of Abraham. He says, show proof of your repentance. In other words, let's live it. You've got to live this. It's got to come out of you. You can't just speak it and claim it. you got to live it. And then he says, what after that? He says, even now, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, right? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's bold, all right? And I know there are places out there around this country, there's a handful of dioceses I've been told I'm not allowed back in anymore. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. Someone called me about 10 years, uh, no, a few years back and said, hey, Doug, we'd like you to come to this particular diocese. And so my daughter was running my office and my bookings at the time, and she said, Dad, so-and-so. And I said, you know, I've been to that diocese. Tell them to check with the chancery because I might still be on their list. The guy contacted my daughter a few days later and said, yeah, he's still on a list. You know what I was talking about, why I got kicked out of the diocese? I was talking about hell. 
You know what part of hell I was talking about? Back to the story of Fatima. I was talking about the vision that the three children saw on July 13th, 1917. I talk about the DVDs and CDs that I have out there. There's a couple that I'm going to promote heavily here, and I really hope you guys pick a copy up of this and buy it, too. Don't just pick it up, but buy it, too. That's, I hope you pick one of these up. It's like, okay, we did it. <laughs> Stay on mission. Stay on mission. Marrying apparitions of our time. Because of time here, I'm down to 24 minutes and 34 seconds. I got I to gotta tighten this up a little bit so I can't go into the whole thing. It's a whole hour-long talk on five major apparitions of the Blessed Mother in the last 100 years, approved by the church, worthy of devotion, where she has come to the world and she has warned us of the seriousness of our times. I start with Fatima, and I work on up to the last one I mentioned is Our Lady of Akita, uh, excuse me, Our Lady of Cabijo in Rwanda, Africa. I want to mention both those briefly here because they work incredibly well for this whole point of this talk about being battle ready. Number one, Fatima, 1917, July 13th, third apparition, children, seven, nine, and ten years old. And Mary says, I wish to show you something. She opens her hands, light comes from her hands, pierces the ground, the ground disappears. The three children are staring into hell. They, 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 they describe it. Lucia writes about it. Sea of fire, countless souls in human form, transparent, burning inside and out. It echoes a lot of what Faustina talks about when she is shown the seven tortures of hell, which she writes about in the diary. I just recently did a video. I have a YouTube channel under Doug Berry. I'm going to recommend U.S. Grace Force and Doug Berry YouTube channels. A lot of meat and potatoes there, a lot of material you can use, hopefully benefit from, grow from, and share with others. Just check out YouTube, U.S. Grace Force, and Doug Berry, and share it with others. We've got to get this word out. It is so critical in the times we're in that we feed people with what is necessary to help us fight this fight. So, July 13, 1917, shows them the vision of hell, ends the vision. She says, this is the place where poor sinners go who have nobody to pray for them or make sacrifices for them. She talks about devotion to her immaculate heart. She talks about uh, that the Second World War will come if man doesn't stop offending God. And guess what happens? It comes 21 years later. The death toll, horrendous. Fast forward to the last one that I talk about on this DVD, and that is Our Lady of Kibiho, when she appears in Rwanda, Africa, to three teenagers. One particular one I'll focus on, Alphonsine. In 1982, she shows Alphonsine a vision. The vision that she shows Alphonsine, this teenage girl, terrifies Alphonsine. She cannot understand what she is seeing. She sees images of thousands upon thousands of bodies lying dead on the ground. So many dead bodies thrown into the river in Rwanda, they called it a river of blood. No one knew what this meant. Twelve years later, it happened. Some of you all old enough remember that. The Rwandan genocide. The genocide in Rwanda where in 90 days, approximately one million people were murdered in a civil war between the Tutsis and the Hutus was prophesied 12 years prior by the Blessed Mother. Just as in Fatima in World War II, Our Lady said, this is a consequence that God allows when man will not repent. He allows our own destruction if we choose it. Gentlemen, we're living in a time right now that is not better than the time of the prophecy of World War II or the prophecy of the genocide in Rwanda. And we men represent an enormous number of people. One husband, seven worlds, my wife and my five kids. So do the math based on who you are. This isn't just 1,500 plus guys. Because we are the spiritual heads of our home, because we have a powerful influence in our families and grandchildren and so forth, how many worlds do you represent? Your wife, your children, grandchildren, children-in-law, the influence that you have, spiritual and otherwise natural, is enormous. There are 10,000 or more people represented here easily. What we do with it matters. And it's got to be the type of attitude that is an attitude that's, you know what, not on my watch. The third individual that I really love, that really infects, affected me and has for so many years, is King David. Why? Because King David, he was roughly a teenager. How old are you, my friend? 12 years old, let's say 12, maybe a little bit older than 12. We got a 15, 16 year old young man, give or take, any right there? Go ahead. Any teenager boy, any teenage boys here that are 15, 16, 17 ish, go ahead and stand up, please. How many we got? Anybody? Stand up. Teenage boys, okay. Don't have, what's the matter with you guys? You're taking your time. It's like they're looking at each other. You're gonna stand up? I don't know. You wanna stand up? 
All right, just stay standing through this little bit here. Look at these young men. This is roughly, and I asked Scott, I checked with Scott last night on this. He says, roughly teenage. He says, yeah, estimated, yeah. Okay, so ballpark. This is roughly the age of King David. King David is a shepherd boy. King David has taken out a bear and a lion who tried to destroy his sheep. King David, when this moment of Goliath appears, and you got the Philistine army one side, you got the Israelites over here, and you got this kind of a big wide ravine area out here, and there's Goliath down there pounding his chest, bring me your champion. I will battle him, and whoever wins, wins the day the army becomes the, the, the slave of the other, and so forth and such. And he's mouthing off about God, he's getting all belligerent, and there's Saul on the other side going, uh, we got anybody? We got anybody? Anybody going to? And all the guys over there going, oh, you can do it. You can do it. I don't know. And there's David. What's going on here, man? What's going on? Hey, Goliath is down there mouthing off. He's what? 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 What's he saying? Oh, this and that and the other thing about God and so forth. <gasps> no way. Done. Done deal. Let me go. He goes to Saul. Saul says, I don't think you can handle this. He's like, are you kidding? I, I, I killed a bear. I killed a lion. What's this? This. He eventually calls him an uncircumcised Philistine. Who is this guy? So they try to throw armor on him, and David says, that's not what God has given me. I haven't earned the armor. I know what I'm going to do. And he's got the sling. So he's a guy, young man, roughly like you young men right here. And his attitude is the most important thing we're going to emphasize here. He's not a sissy. He doesn't look at the combat situation and say, oh, I don't know, it doesn't look safe. His attitude is, this isn't right. This is wrong. And as a man, I deal with what's wrong. And I try to do my best as an instrument of God to make it right. So what's he do? Scripture says he ran towards the Philistine army. He runs down there. Goliath mouthing off to him again. Who is this? What is this? This is all you got? And he threatens David. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to leave your flesh out here for the birds of the air and the beasts of the land. You know what David says essentially back to him? I don't think so. I think I'm going to do that to you. He says you will not mock God anymore. He takes that stone, one of those five stones he picks, he puts it in the sling. He knows what he's doing. Everybody, uh, Philistines, looking at this, probably thinking, what's he thinking? He's got a stone and a sling against Goliath. We know Goliath. We've seen Goliath rip people's heads off, maybe literally. We know Goliath is a beast of a warrior, and he is well-trained and battle-hardened. And David was out there, and all David was saying was, God will give me what I need. And he let that stone fly, and it hit Goliath in the head, knocked him out. Now, that's normally where we stop with the story with our kids when they're little, right? Little Jimmy, seven-year-old, going to bed. Ooh, and he hit Goliath in the head and knocked him out. <gasps> wow, you sleep well, Jimmy. Okay, Daddy? Yeah, what is it? What happened next? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Don't tell your mom I said this, okay? She didn't think you're old enough for this, but I know you are, son. Then Goliath, lying on the ground, dazed. It's like that spinning wheel of death on your computer monitor, you know? Not knowing what's going to happen next. David knew. And Scripture says David ran at him. Young men, roughly like you young men, ran at that Goliath after knocking him down. You knew that was move one. Now move two has got to seal the deal. Pounce on him. Pull Goliath's sword you can almost imagine the Philistine army looking at this moment going, oh my goodness, I don't believe I'm seeing this. That kid is about to, oh, he did. <laughs> Dispatches his head. You can almost imagine him picking it up, looking at the Philistines. Who's next? <laughs> Good night, Jimmy. Sleep well. <sighs> Jimmy's going to have different dreams that night, isn't he? Yeah. Are you young men any different than King David? Now, what does God say about King David? He is the only person in the history of Scripture that God says, this is a man after my own heart. And what was David? He was a warrior. Did he fall? Yeah, Scott talked about that earlier today, right? The sins and so forth. Yeah, that happens. Because even though we're trying faithfully to fight for the glory of God and the kingdom of heaven and the salvation of souls, we mess up. But God's mercy, right here, we see it. Smoke, Wafting out. Demons. No. David fell later, but David had a heart of a warrior. Are you any different than him? Are you built any different than him? Is your DNA any different than David's or yours or any of us men? No. So these young men we see standing before us right now, they are just as capable as David 
when it comes to taking on evil in this world toe-to-toe and by the power of God, winning the day. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a seat. So, what I realized as I was growing up, my, God, my father, God bless him, my father died from a massive heart attack about 28 years ago. My father was an alcoholic. My father didn't really have this in him at all. My father didn't teach me any of this sort of stuff. I have no ill feelings towards my father. I grew up in an alcoholic family, and that was really hard. I won't get into that. It was really hard, though. All right? But I looked at these three characters in Scripture. They have affected me many times over the years, and they still do. St. Joseph, of course, my spiritual father, the father of the fatherless. All right? John the Baptist. Why John the Baptist? You know what? He did what God told him to do, and he didn't worry about what anybody else said. He was in tune with God, in tune with the Holy Spirit, as St. Joseph. And David, King David, heart of a warrior, ran towards the Philistines. And why? Because he said, I'm tougher than you. No, it wasn't about self. David said, you will not do this. You will not mock God. You will not mock God. What do we do as men, though, when it comes to the mockery of God, the mockery of the faith, the mockery of family, the mockery of the dignity of the human person when it comes to something like as, as horrible and evil as pornography? Do you men have that something in you that will fight for your loved ones? I was at a conference in Indiana, about 1,000 guys, and I said, all right, guys, hey, do you love your families? Yeah, no, I want you to shout it out. Don't worry about it right now for sake of time. I said, who loves your family? Yeah, I love my family. I want to hear it. Yeah, I love my Would you fight for your family? Yeah, I'd fight for my family. Would you die for your family? Yeah, I'd die for my family. What happens to your family after you're dead? And they all went, ah, oh, yeah, good point. I said, so what's the answer? And one guy yells out in the back, learn how to fight. Absolutely. Let's make a little comparison here. If you love your families right now, tonight, let's say tonight, let's say you find out later someone's going to kick in your door tonight. What would you do to prepare? Let's say you didn't have any time to prepare. Someone kicks in your door tonight to hurt your family, hurt your loved ones. Do you have a plan to defend? <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. I've been waiting for someone to ask me that. Yeah. <laughs> Leather dogs, yeah, let's go. Absolutely, that should be our attitude. It should be without hesitation. I've asked men this all over the country. Do you have a plan? And some guys look at me, ah, and you see this look in their face. A couple of guys have said, yeah, I'm going to call 911. <laughs> so what's your response time? Uh, a few minutes. How much can happen in a few minutes? Average response time. I do a lot of self-defense training stuff. I've got a self-defense background from when I was 12 years old to now. I've trained with a number of different people in a number of different areas, and I do a lot of church security training stuff in Tyler, Texas, the diocese that I moved to about seven months ago. And we know that the threats are out there. If anybody saw the shooting in White Settlement, that church, just a few, uh, few weeks back or so, if you saw that, do you know how long that whole episode lasted? Six seconds. Six seconds. And I will say, when you look at the, at the, you look at the video and you analyze it, you break it down, no one had to die. There were some red flags. There were a few mistakes possibly made. I'm not faulting what they did. I mean, the two gentlemen who died, uh, innocent guys who died, you know, God bless them. You only, in a crisis, spiritual or physical, you only respond to the highest level of your training. Anybody who's fire rescue, law enforcement, military, you understand that. You only respond to the highest level of your training. I've had law enforcement in conversations like this. I've given the talks. They'll come up or they'll admit in the crowd right there. Oh, absolutely. Let me tell you this. When the bullets were flying, a Houston police officer was telling me this recently. Houston police officer. Oh, yeah, bullets were flying. He said, all the emotions that start coming out of you, you can't think. You do what you've been trained to do. You do what your training says to do. Spiritually speaking, it needs to be the same way, though. What are we training ourselves to do in spiritual conflicts? Say, for example, pornography. Pornography is a natural and, and spiritual attack. Demons trying to get in there and trying to twist the way we think, trying to twist the emotions, trying to use lust and all these things, trying to use depression, discouragement, because that's what drives a lot of guys into pornography is I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, I'm down, it's been a rough day at work, I'm worried about this, all this stress on me, and it becomes an escapism for a lot of guys. What do you do when those things are hidden, those natural and spiritual moments? Because the demons are really good at twisting that stuff. Father Chad Ripker, the exorcist, says the demons have access to our files. In other words, think of a computer file, right? Double-click that file on the screen, opens up. They have access. They know what we've put in our minds. They know what we've, they can't read our minds, but they know what we've done. They're, they're allowed to have access to our, to our memories, our history, and so forth. Don't give them ammunition. Right? So, what do we do if someone kicks in the door? 
I mean, we've got a firearm next to the bed. You've got pepper spray, bear spray, baseball bat, frying pan, something. Have you taught your loved ones what to do? Because that's our job, to teach them what to do spiritually and physically if there's a threat, an attack. To be battle ready, body, mind, and soul. And you know what? It's in the nature of men to be fighters, protectors, and defenders. The other DVD I'm going to mention that I'm really going to encourage you guys to get. I brought 100 copies of each of these two, and I have others out there. I have a self-defense training DVD. I have another DVD. It's a parish mission DVD called Battle Ready Live. But this one here, first line of defense. You and I, men, are the first line of defense. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to wrap up this talk with a story about this, how we are the first line of defense. But the devil knows we're the first line of defense. This DVD is the type of DVD. It's short, punchy, to the point, and it basically says to men, look, it's in our nature to fight and defend. Physically, most of us get that, although some of us have gotten pretty soft in that department. And we defer that authority, that right to defend to others. We give it to others, like calling 911 and then hoping and praying that it just doesn't happen bad enough until the cops get here. When we need to be the first line of defense. I gave a talk like this down in Florida in a men's group, and a man said to me at the end, he was sitting there the whole time kind of grumpy looking, kind of sitting there, arms crossed, I thought, this guy either is really on board and is fired up. Because sometimes I get that. Some guys will sit there like this, and then afterwards they'll say, man, Doug, halfway through your talk, I wanted to go through a wall. It's like, okay, you sure didn't look like that sitting there. You looked angry. No, it's because I was angry at the sin of the world. Okay, I get it. I get it. I do. I wasn't sure. Finally, he puts his hand up. I'm going to say something. I said, what's that? He said, I'm a retired Long Island detective. I said, I'll bet you've seen a lot. And this is what he said. I have seen brains splattered on a wall. I've seen a lot. And I can tell you what you're saying is 100% accurate. You call the police, you can expect when the police show up, 95% of the time or more, we're there for two reasons. Clean up the mess and take the report. I've had other police officers tell me, that guy's being generous. I'd say it's close to 100% of the time. In other words, gentlemen, we need to have a plan spiritually, as we would physically, to protect not only ourselves, but our loved ones. It is on us. When we stand before God, how have we led our family spiritually? Do they know who God is? Have we shown them God's mercy? Have we shown them what it looks like for dad to be in line for confession? What dad does when he prays the rosary? And dad takes care of himself and is ready for the fight physically if it comes. Because God has put us in this position, just as St. Joseph was in the position to care for the Holy Family, we are in position to care for our families. So I would say, if someone kicks you in your door, do you have a plan to protect and defend your family? All right? And how fast can you operate that plan? Have you practiced it, rehearsed it? Guys say to me all the time, oh, yeah, I'm a hunter, I got a gun. Where's your gun? It's in my gun safe, in your home, yeah. Where's the ammo? Is it loaded time? A lot of guys, no, it's in a box up here, okay. I want you to do this. Go home and time yourself. Lay in bed in a dark room. Imagine it's a nighttime kick-in and have somebody say, go! Right, so you don't know what's gonna happen and how fast can you get to the safe, unlock it, get the gun, put a round in it and chamber it. Obviously, make sure you got the muzzle in the right place when you do that. Point being, be in a position where you're ready to go if you have to. And then multiply that by five, six, seven. Because under stress, it's not going to be as fast or as smooth. Why do I say that? On the natural level, we understand that. Spiritually, it's got to be the same way and more so. Because most of us, please God, are never going to have a home invasion. But most all of us are going to have, every day, some sort of spiritual attack, body, mind, or soul. We know this comes from the world of flesh and the devil. We know we're in the thick of this fight. We need to be men who are prepared. So I had a guy walk up to me after a conference one time. He comes up and he says, Doug, I gotta talk to you. I'm standing at the table, like my table out here where the DVDs and CDs are. Did I mention that yet? Okay. <laughs> just, just making sure, right? He comes up to me and he goes, I gotta talk to you, big guy. I mean, you can tell he worked out. I mean, I work out, but this guy's like, whoa. I mean, his arms are like my leg, right? And he comes up and he goes, I wanna talk to you. I said, okay. Yeah, we can, we can talk. You bet, man. We step to the side. He says, man, I am getting my butt kicked on the internet. I said, pornography? He goes, oh, yeah. It has destroyed me, man. I don't know what to do. This was a family talk, by the way, I had given. So men and women like were there. I was talking about defending the family. I didn't even really mention much about pornography, but it, something struck a chord with him. So he comes up and says this to me. He says, I don't know what to do. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you work out, right? Yeah. You ready to fight for your family? Oh, yeah. I said, if a bad guy comes in the house and tries to hurt your wife, what would you do to him? Well, I'd destroy him. I said, okay. Does your wife know about the pornography? Oh, yeah. Then you're the bad guy. You're the one that's kicked in the door. And he looked at me and stood up and said, whoa. I never thought of it that way. 
I said, so you train and prepare to protect your wife against other people who would hurt her, right? He said, oh, yeah. I said, then you do that even against yourself. You train and prepare spiritually and naturally. Don't just pray rosaries, guys, and fast and such and think that all the temptations of things like pornography or, or gluttony or sloth and all this are going to go away. There has to be natural accountability, too. Down in Texas, I run a Wednesday night workout group. We get about 25 up to 30 guys who come almost without fail. The oldest guy is 69. The youngest kid is nine. And they come, and we do for about one hour. We do kind of workout. It's simple stuff. Tabata, it's called. Four-minute workout. So we stretch out. We loosen up. We go through the workout. All calisthenic workout in a gym. No equipment necessary. And then we talk about faith. We talk about the character of a man. And then we do a little basic self-defense training, church security stuff. These guys are eating it up because we men are hungry for this. This is iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. But what are the consequences of us if we don't do these things? If we don't take action where we are called to take action as husbands and fathers, as young men even, these young guys who have, they don't know what their vocation is yet, he's 12, okay, but he needs to see us older men, he needs to be accountable to us, and we need to let him know even at 12 and all the young guys here, you have a responsibility to duty, you can be ready for. And it's spiritual and natural. And so a friend of mine, Pat Madrid, some of you know Patrick Madrid, and I was at a conference with him one time, and he's, he's telling this story. And the story goes like this. I'm a short version here for time. Pat Madrid's given, the, he's reading a letter. A guy wrote him a letter. And Pat had given a talk, Patrick had given a talk on men being active in the faith and not, and not sitting on the couch and letting bad things happen. And so he's reading this letter. And in the letter, the letter goes something to the effect of, um, Patrick, I was walking home from work one day. Talk about consequence of an action, right? Walking home from work one day, and I'm nighttime, and I'm going down the sidewalk passing a park, and it's dark out. And I hear a woman in the park screaming for help. I can very muffled voice, but it's a woman calling for help. And I can hear the guy, you know, kind of grumbling and trying to, he's wrestling with, you could tell the wrestling match is on. And he says, my first thought was, I, I'm, not, I'm not an athlete, I'm not physically built, I'm not a fighter, I, I can't go in there, what am I going to do? I know, I got to find her help. So he said, so I was moving away to go find her help. Now some of you are thinking right now, you're kidding me, you're walking away from this. He said, then I stopped and I thought, I can't. I'm hearing the sounds. I can't just walk away. I got to go. So I ran into the park. He says, I ran into the darkness knowing there was evil in there and I didn't know what I was going to do. I couldn't make out faces, skin color, age, anything. I just knew this was the woman, this was the man, and I went at the man. And I was scrapping. He's just swinging anything he can. And the woman jumps in the bushes and hides. And the bad guy, being a coward, because most of them are, when anybody puts up a reasonable fight, they bail. And he did. He took off. And so the good guy says, so there I was kind of shaking it out, kind of re-getting myself together. And I said, ma'am, it's okay. You can come out now. The bad guy's gone. Didn't hear anything. Sniffling. <laughs> a few seconds go by. Ma'am, it's okay. You can come out now. The bad guy's gone. A few more seconds go by. And then he hears this. Dad? Dad, is that you? It was his daughter. He said, Patrick, I could have gone home, turned on the news, and heard that some other woman had been assaulted, maybe even murdered. This time it would have been my own daughter. The consequence of our inaction, gentlemen, can be devastating. It is devastating. We're seeing it. Don't be that. The prayer, the sacraments, but even the physical preparation to care for our loved ones is paramount. I can't encourage you enough again when it comes to this stuff out here. There was a book I wanted, Scott had a book I wanted to talk about. I don't remember the name of it. Oh, here it is. Thank you, Scott. I, I, oh. <laughs> it's not worth much now. <laughs> I asked Father Calloway and Scott for something. I, I want to promote their stuff, not just my stuff. I want you to understand this isn't self-promotion for the sake of me. It's it's, I believe in Scott's work and Father Calloway's work. And all the vendors out there got great stuff. The Fourth Cup by Scott Hahn. If you haven't read The Fourth Cup, this is powerful. This gets to that deep, that, that intellectual, spiritual level that we all need to go to. Do you know what the demons despise? Mental prayer. They despise mental thought, contemplation on God's truth. That's what something like Fourth Cup can bring you. Don't ever be the type of guy that says, oh, man, that's above me. That's way too much for me. Look, I, I didn't even go to college. I barely got out of high school. I'm not joking around either. 
right? But I fell in love with the faith, and I started picking up books like this. I've read a lot of Scott's stuff. I've read Fulton Sheen, Thomas More, Teresa of Avila. Father Thomas Dubé wrote a book called Fire Within about contemplative prayer for Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, two great mystics of the church. I can't tell you how that set me on fire. I still work out. I still practice martial arts. I still go through the physical training, but the spiritual training is above all the most important. Something like the fourth cup, the consecration of St. Joseph book from Father Calloway, and the CDs and DVDs I have aren't bad either. I, I hope they're not. I mean, their stuff is amazing, but I hope you like the DVDs and CDs as well. I'm going to close with one short story. My clock just went zero, but if I can give like two minutes, I just want to throw this in if it's all right. Gentlemen, when I was younger, my wife and I pregnant with our first child. I didn't realize how serious the battle was and how ready for the battle I needed to be. I went and spoke with the priest. My bishop, Bishop Breskowitz at the time, said, Doug, new ministry? Good. I want you to go speak with this priest. He's good at forming new orders. He'll help you get things started. I said, okay, it's not an order. It's a ministry, but he can help anyway. I said, okay. So I go there. My wife is not with me at this meeting. There's a couple of college students who were volunteering and working with me, but my wife was not there. We're pregnant with our first child. We've been married just over a year, and we're just a few months pregnant with our first child. And I sit down with Father, and he says, a new ministry. I said, yeah. He says, tell me. He said, how's your marriage? So marriage is good. I, I didn't understand this. And then he made it clear. Your vocation is your path to sanctity. It's your path to heaven. Your vocation. Be on fire for your vocation. Everything else flows from that. Okay. All right. I get it. Then he said this. I'm shortening the story here. He says, tell me this, Doug. He said, um, do you pray with your wife? I said, sure I do. He said, do you lead the prayer? You know, being the spiritual head of the family. But I was like a lot of men. You might know what this statement means, right? I looked at him and I said, well, my wife's pretty good at it, so I let her do it. <laughs> he didn't think that was funny. He looked at me, I don't care what kind of a speaker you are, kind of a man you are, and how good you are with your words. He says, you need to lead the prayer. The demons know this, too, by the way. The demons understand when a man steps to the side of his responsibility when it comes to leading the family in this way. So then he looks at me and he says, tell me this, do you bless your wife, the baby in the womb, and your home with holy water? I said, well, no. He said, why not? Matter of fact, why not? He didn't give me any kind of a, well, here's something you might want to think about. He flat out said, why not? And I said, well, to do that, Father, I'd have to hire a bunch of monks, sing Gregorian chant, light incense. <laughs> he didn't laugh <laughs> at all. He looked right at me, and he put his finger to me. And I'm not exaggerating. This is what he said. This is where I got the title of that DVD, First Line of Defense. He said, Doug, look, Satan is trying to destroy your family. You are the head of the house. You are the first line of defense. What are you doing about it? So I went home that night with a bottle of holy water because he gave it to me. Priests can make holy water very easily. They have the power to do that. We lay people, it's different for us. We can't make it so easily. This is a joke, okay, because we can't make holy water. Okay, follow me on this? All right. The joke is for a lay person to make holy water, we have to put water in, the, on a, in a pot, put the pot on the stove, turn the heat up, and boil the hell out of it. <laughs> Terrible joke. Okay, I let me finish this up here so we can get done here. So... I go home with the holy water. Now, he even gave me an idea what to do. Put a drop on your finger. Trace the sign of the cross on your wife's forehead and say a prayer from your heart in the name of Jesus, telling the demons to stay away from your wife. That's a binding prayer, by the way, guys. In the name of Jesus, claiming the authority that I have over the flesh of this woman that God has given me through the natural law of marriage, right? I have the authority here. I can, in the name of Jesus, bind the demons and tell them, command them to stay away from my wife and my kids. That's what he was teaching me. I didn't get it. A little slow to the uptake there, right? So I go home with the holy water. He said, do that above the doorways as well. Sprinkle it over your home. Do it over the baby's womb, the baby in the womb. So I went home, pull out the holy water, stand in there. My wife, by the way, before I pulled out the holy water, she said, how was the meeting with Father? Oh, it was good. What did he say? He said, we should pray a lot. Anything else? No, that's about it. <laughs> no backbone. Major spiritual sissy. I could hear a voice in my head. Buck, 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 buck. So I wait till she goes to bed, because I'm such a man. She goes to bed, I pull the holy water out, I close the bedroom door, I'm standing there in that little apartment, little economy apartment, you know, ironing board comes out of the wall, you know, kitchen comes out of the wall, it's a dinky one. And I'm sprinkling holy water here and there. Guys, this was my opening prayer, I am not kidding. Lord, I have no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> but I know I gotta do something. Drop a holy water above the door, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, may no evil come into this home. Okay, next doorway. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, may no evil come in this home. Blessed Mother, protect us. Yeah, feeling good, right? No oh, sounds, but I knew in my heart it was right. 
So I open the bedroom door, and there's my wife lying there sleeping. And I'm standing in the doorway, and the light's shining from the hallway. And I thought, there she is, my bride, my queen. I will fight for her. I'll go through walls for her. Right? I will, but I, I just got to walk over and bless her now. She doesn't even have to know I'm doing it. Which eliminates a fair amount of this, because understand, we're physical and spiritual beings. You put your arms around your wife. You hug her, and you say, these arms are for you. These arms protect you. This body is to serve and work for you. You know what your wife's going to say to you? <laughs> yes. Okay? There's a natural and spirit. There's a spiritual, natural, emotional, psychological. It's all there. It's all part of who we are. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't walk over there. So I'm standing there in the doorway, and I thought, I just got to tiptoe. Nope, I can't do it. I know. I'm stuck to the floor. I know. Uh, if I fling the holy water and it hits her, that'll count. So with the holy water across her face, she's a light sleeper. She sat up. She looked at the door. She saw the light. I froze in the door. All I could think was, don't move, and she won't see you. Become the door. And she looks at me, and she says, Doug, what are you doing? And I said, I'm blessing the apartment with holy water. She said, okay. She goes back to sleep. I close the door, walk in the kitchen, put the water down. I remember thinking to myself, I'm never doing that again. That's a lofty spiritual thing for someone else, but not little old me. And that's what some of you might be thinking now, right? I was so wrong. Next morning, I am begging, please, Lord, that she does not remember this. She's sitting at the breakfast table. I'm eating my cereal, and she says, I had a funny dream last night. I said, what was that, sweetheart? I dreamt you were blessed in the apartment. Was, oh, my goodness, yes, I was. And I, <laughs> Cheerios all over the table. I, I admitted it. I said, this is what Father said. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do this. It's just hard. And then a little while later, she looked at me, and she said, you know what, Doug? I realize not only are you putting a roof over the head and food on the table, you're trying to take care of this marriage spiritually. She was beaming. You know how we are when our wives like what we do? You should have seen me then. <sighs> That's right, baby. <laughs> I got the swagger. I'm doing a hero pose. When you married me, you made the right choice. <laughs> to this day, I bless my wife and my children almost every single day I see them with holy water if they're at my house. I mean, I don't do it in the restaurant, you know, and then, you know... Applebee's, you know, come here, son. Let me bless you before you leave here. No, but I do it. I hug them. I tell them I love them. I'm praying for them, but I bless them with holy water still. Why? Because a priest looked at me in the eyes, and he said, Doug, you are the first line of defense. What are you doing about it? And it's the same with you guys. That's what we are. We need to be battle ready. We need to be prepared for this fight. So one more time, I am going to just recommend Scott's fourth cup book, Go Deeper. And oh, he's got a lot of great stuff out there. Go Deeper. Father Calloway's Consecration of St. Joseph, go deeper, spiritually speaking. And, and naturally speaking, we've got to go deeper. The DVDs and CDs, ammunition, material, armament, artillery for the fight. Gentlemen, let us be battle ready, body, mind, and soul. We are in this fight, and a lot's riding on our shoulders. Let's be that man of character, that man of honor. Let's be the new Davids, right, that we know we can be by the grace of God. God bless you all. Thank you very much.